Hi, everybody. Uh, so our membership team has been doing so many of these Zoom calls over the past several months. Um, and as we've been trying to stay in touch with so many of our members, we came up with this idea of screen talk. So, uh, and, and that was in order to share helpful tools and also to try to maintain a sense of community for our uh, industry. And this is one of the first ones for me doing this series. I'm thrilled to get this conversation going with our guest composer, Roger Neal, who has such an interesting background and also an impressive list of credits, which includes some exciting recent projects we'll talk about shortly. So let's get started. Roger, thanks for hey. taking the time to join us. So happy to be here. Thank you. So what, would, what advice would you give to an aspiring composer today trying to build their career here in LA, especially during these challenging pandemic times? Well, yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, and the answer is, is probably radically different now than it would have been six months ago. In the past, I've always felt it was uh, a great advantage to be here in Los Angeles. And so many composers that I've worked with have moved here from all over the world to start their careers. Um, it's just a handicap, I think, to start elsewhere. That's about always been the case. But what about now? The, the advantage of being in Los Angeles is a proximity. To, uh, to jobs and to other creative people and to people and to ASCAP and other organizations like that and to this great community. That is no longer um, a physical advantage, right? I mean, you, it's, unfortunately we're not having those meetings, we're not having those screenings, we're not having those award shows. So, so at this moment in time today, there's no advantage of being in Los Angeles. You could, you could, you could be elsewhere, you could be anywhere for that matter. Um, then the question comes, well, what, so what, uh, what do you do instead? You know, what's the alternative? Um, we're all now in a virtual world and part of the answer has to be just um, uh, is managing and growing your virtual presence in a way that's gonna be helpful to your career. Your social media handles and all that kind of stuff. How do people find you? Yeah, exactly. In fact, I had a surprising uh, chat with my own agent yesterday and this is a, uh, intelligence I probably shouldn't share because it benefits me, but here it goes, Ask Up World. Um, she said the shock, a very shocking thing to me yesterday. She said um, that there are producers out there looking for composers who are asking about their social media presence, who are saying, no, I don't want to hire that composer because they don't have enough followers. Like, that's kind of crazy. I haven't but, heard that. But that's, you know, that's straight from the, uh, the mouth of, you know, people, uh, someone who's an artist rep, my, my rep, and that was kind of shocking, and, well, that, but also not surprising in a way, you know. Accessibility, uh, how, how do uh, you find filmmakers today, and I guess it also depends on how many credits you have, right? I mean, you've been in the business now, you know, for well over 20 years, uh, and you've got an established list of relationships already, right? Always looking for more, though. <laughs> always looking for more, and uh, and fresh ones and the, and, the la and the latest things. So, so yeah. Um, you know, it's always shocking when, when, when you do that trick of, uh, uh, not trick, but like, you know, the exercise of Googling yourself, what comes up? Um, if there's somebody who has kind of heard of me as a composer or any of my colleagues, you know, you, you one assumes that the director is gonna Google us and see, see what they get and look at other platforms, you know, my, my, my uh, Twitter and Instagram universe and, and Facebook and even Wikipedia and, you know, things of that sort. So. I think you're speaking to something that's, that's, you know, I'm still learning too, but that social engagement really does get those numbers going. Uh, and, and whether it's Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, um, some communities tend to migrate more on one platform than another. Um, having uh, that, uh, that's an interesting approach, Googling yourself. That's, I, I, that's actually a really good trick. Because then you can kind of start to self-evaluate and really focus on something, how to change right. that or improve and, it. And you, and you, get, you can get overly obsessed with this stuff, right? You know, you could, there are people I know who are, you know, are, are, are posting every day on things uh, on, on Facebook and it becomes a kind of oppressive. But I did this once really at, my, um, at the office of my, uh, my talent reps uh, and we all Googled together, me. And they, we looked at the results and we were like, eh, okay. Um, some improvement can be made. Um, were, so, the, were the results similar? Well, it was just like, well, what, what comes up? Like what people are gonna, people are gonna spend 
30 seconds Googling Mike Todd, you know, it's interesting to find out what's the first thing, first things that come up, what's the first impression. And, um, you know, you should try to try to manage that, I think, as an artist, to some extent, um, to try to manage what that first impression is, or if people are going to try to find you, what do they find? You know, what, what are the articles? Or if they look on your, um, your website or your social media sites, what comes up? Because, you know, most of us are going to spend a few seconds or minutes at the most forming an opinion about people that we encounter online. If I'm interested in finding out about such and such a director, you know, I'm going to form that opinion if, uh, rapidly. Quick impression. Yeah. Well, all that said, I mean, what are some of the ways you've adapted to these challenges and, and, and I guess accelerated changes, you know, given these social distancing measures? Like, are you recording with any live players? I am, but, uh, but it's, all, it's all virtual um, in, insofar as I, I will create tracks at home, in my home studio, which I'm in right now, um, and then send, uh, send out parts to, to various players. And I'll have, you know, a dozen different players on a particular queue, but they've all recorded, for the most part, separately. I haven't done the thing where I've tried to organize a session virtually that's simultaneous. I know many of my colleagues have done that. Um, but, you know, I'll send out the uh, part to the drummer and a part to the guitar player and a part to the singer and a part to this and that, and then, and then compile it. But another thing I'm doing, doing also um, during the pandemic more and more, this is a trend I think which has been in present, but it's accelerating, is I'm just doing more things myself. I'm recording more instruments, uh, instruments that I don't even play. Um, <laughs> And that can be oddly a really powerful tool for a composer to record themselves playing, say, violin. I don't play violin, but I know how to like make sounds out of it. And that becomes like me not knowing how to play violin becomes an instrument and a sound that I can exploit for my for my sports. And it's and it's unique in that way too, I guess. It's unique in that way too, and it's free. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, but I, I feel for all the live musicians or the recording musicians who uh, have these challenges now. I, I was. Got but they're it. making their own adjustments, Mike. I mean, they're, they're, everybody is, uh, who's a recording musician um, is putting together their home studios, you know, and, and they have been, but it's, it's even more important now, not, not even just to be able to record yourself as a, as a player, but to be something of a producer. Uh, if I send a part off to a cello player, I really would like them to sort of have a sound which is cool, um, like put some thought into the mic placement uh, uh, and the sound that they're getting back, something that's unique and specific to the piece of music we're working on, and just make a track which is unusual and, and awesome um, so that I don't have to. Yeah. Right. So as musicians out there who are, who are running their own home operations, it really can be a really great opportunity um, to be able to present a sound which is super unique to themselves. It's not just how they play, it's how they record, now they produce the tracks that they give to their clients. Well, you know, I, I was looking at your credits and you've got such a, a diverse, um, you know, variety of credits from film and TV, commercials, musical theater, doing arrangements and orchestration. Can you remember early on in your career, were you supporting other composers at any point to kind of get to where you are today? How did you go about that? Is oh, sure. And I still am. I still am. This is, I think, maybe a, a, a well-kept secret that a lot of younger composers should know. I mean, there are times when I don't have gigs, and I'll reach out to some of my client friends, you know, good friends of mine who, who I love and respect, and I'll say, hey, I'm not, nothing's happening here in my studio for a month. Do you have anything to work on? And, and I'll say, yeah, look, come work on this movie with me for a couple of weeks. And I love it because it's, it's a way to, um, to look over the shoulders of, of other composers and, and learn from them. So. In, when I was younger, I had great mentors who, who um, provided that role, but even now I still do it because I really enjoy doing it, really enjoy collaborating. I know a lot of other composers do the same. You know, we tend to be very isolated people, so <laughs> we have the chance to actually work with other people. It's well, a friggin' delight. <laughs> that's, that speaks to another thing, like are there any other specific online groups or forums that you might be a part of? And, and something we can share with the, you know, folks out there? Well, um, there are things specific that I, I enjoy doing, just like these different um, master classes I've done. Um, I'm a digital performer user, and, Mo, and Motu has been doing a great master class series. And it's a great way, for example, for me to learn about that software, but also to see 
40 familiar faces and uh, during the Zoom meeting and just, you know, checking with people and, and just kind of feel like, oh yeah, they're all still out there. <laughs> We're all still out there doing our stuff. Um, well, I think anytime you get in, you engage in these kind of groups, there's always something to learn from someone, I'm sure. Yeah, there certainly is. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, you forget about people. That's what's, that's what's good about, that's what's wonderful about real mixers when you meet people out in the world. It's like, oh, I haven't seen that, that old friend for a while. But now it's, it's all virtual. And it's, you know, I'm really trying to make an extra effort now more than ever to reach out to old friends and colleagues just to check in, you know, and see how people are doing. Because times are, are weird for everybody. Yeah. for me and for everybody else. So it, it, it feels good to be able to make some connections now um, with other folks and just uh, well, we see how we're all doing. about this offline earlier, you know, um, like as far as like uh, networking in this industry is like starting with the relationships that you have, regardless of who they are. If they're anything remotely in connection with the industry, that's a starting point, right? Yeah. And even if they're not surprising me, I mean, I really have this weird philosophy, but it's been borne out to be true, which is that you're always going to get the breaks you hope to get, not from people you don't know, but people you know already. And that's true, not just for me living here in, in LA, but for anybody out there, anywhere in the world, at any level of their career, it's probably people that you already know that are going to be the, the doors that lead to um, career opportunities. Yeah. So Roger, can you talk a little more specifically about your range of recent work you have going on? Like, how did you get those gigs? Well, if you take a movie like 20th Century Women, which is one of the scores I'm, I'm most known for, uh, it's from a few years back, but, but fairly recent. Mike Mills is the director, and he's um, a director I've worked with a lot over the years, and we're, and we're good friends. Uh, but the interesting thing about, about that connection is that I can trace the connection to him and many of my, many of my key clients to um, Megan Murphy, who sat next to me in junior high school band. She played clarinet and I played flute. Um, back in, in San Diego, my hometown, which is to say nowhere. Um, and um, we were 11 years old. And from her, like I reunited with this fr old friend of mine later on. She introduced me to a songwriter named Andrew Sandoval, introduced me to an engineer named Brian Key, who introduced me to the band Air. From there, I met these great musicians, including uh, um, Beck and uh, Brian Reitzel, and uh, we all became friends. Uh, and that, from there, I met Roman Coppola and Sofia Coppola and Mike Mills, and just kind of like it's a long story, but but uh, but not really. Like from friends I met back home in El Cajon, um, I can trace to some of the most important jobs. From Megan Murphy next to me in junior high school, come beginners, Mozart in the jungle, 20th century women, so many of my key jobs. Um, and all of that had nothing to do with you getting a PhD from Harvard in music composition. Not a dang thing. <laughs> not a dang thing. That's why I was saying you had such an interesting background. Yeah. Well, the PhD uh, is something is I look at it on it as something I did for a while that was super cool and I enjoyed it. And once I received that credential and then started working professionally afterwards, I realized I had all the um, the skills I needed probably when I was 17 to start the career I have. I just spent 15 years getting there. You have a quick second maybe on uh, talk a little bit about how you got Chuck Lorre's uh, CBS series mom? It was my classical music background because that's move, that TV series is scored with classical music. It's really an odd duck. But um, Warner Brothers was actually just calling around different uh, agents uh, trying to find a music supervisor who has a classical background and there aren't any. Uh, but uh, there really aren't. But I happened to have, like you know I was there, and I just said, "Yeah, Roger." Which, what they needed. Yeah, and it was so it was a combination of, of knowing classical music and also knowing comedy, knowing how to create timing for music. It was just a really a, a really nice combination of skills, and I, I love I love doing the show a lot. I think that's a whole other conversation that we didn't get into is like the whole aspect of the storytelling and really focusing on that, even though you're a composer. I mean, that's, that's like your number one job is understanding the story and communicating that with whoever's hiring you, right? That's everything. Yeah. That's everything. Being a storyteller with music is what film composing is all about. Exactly. So last question. Can you share any mistakes you've learned along your career that, won't, that you won't ever do again? We got like one minute left. I think when I've really blown it, it's been hubris. You know, just maybe 
thinking I was too much all that and and forgetting that it really comes down to being a collaborator a collaborator you know and you're part of a, of a team and no matter how talented you think you are you have to be supporting everybody else and uh and being just a good hang and someone that people want to work with yeah, I, I've seen that so many times in my conversations where the, the, the cue that you totally believe sells the story is something that the director or whoever doesn't connect with, and then they connect with something that you totally thought was a throwaway. It's, yeah. it's so hard to nail, even, even 20 years in a career, right, sometimes? And they're right. I mean, so many times, uh, the director, I mean, so many times I've learned the hard way, you know, I think they've made the wrong decision, but after I've looked through the process and throw away the best music I've ever written, I realized, oh, they were right all along. Well, thanks, Roger. I, I hope this was helpful to our community. This, this, that's it for Screen Talk this time. We'll see you on the next one, and we'll say uh, signing off. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.